Hey, what's going on guys? Ben Brewster here at Triathletics. Uh, today I'm gonna be breaking down some of my favorite implements to work on uh, different soft tissue points throughout your body. So what are my favorite tools to use for the feet, the lower leg, the calves, hips, hamstrings, quads. Uh, we're gonna work all the way from the ground up through the entire body and kind of give you guys some ideas to work from uh, as far as some of the tools that we use here at Tread. Now, a couple of disclaimers. Uh, one, first and foremost, I'm gonna assume that you have a good rationale for attacking a certain tissue in your body, whether that's working with your coach, working with uh, your therapist. Uh, the answer is not always to just smash you know, and grind a tissue into submission. Sometimes uh, that can do more harm than good, but assuming you do have a good rationale, uh, these can be extremely helpful, uh, not just exercises uh, to attack various tissue quality points, um, but the best tools actually get in there for the specific angle, specific tissue that we're trying to work. So again, these are just ideas for you guys to implement. The other piece is why do soft tissue work in the first place? Uh, a really good uh, resource to check out uh, if you kind of want to learn more about this called fascial manipulation. But essentially these researchers went through and they mapped the entire human body uh, head to toe and they looked at what are common points of fascial adhesions and densification throughout the entire body and how do those relate to uh, pain in terms of different muscle groups, different planes of motion. So let's say you're having pain in your bicep when you, you know, apply force in an anterior uh, direction. They've gone through and mapped all the relevant points where they typically will see densification points. And so that can give you a ton of ideas uh, for depending on the pain, the dysfunction, what are certain tissues that we should be attacking with, whether it's a lacrosse ball, a foam roller, or a barbell, some of the different implements that we'll, uh, we'll show you today. So that's just another good resource. As far as what's actually going on, from a mechanism standpoint. Essentially what we're trying to do with all these different implements is we're trying to create a change in the extensibility of these tissues, the hydration and the, the fascial uh, tissue quality of, of the various tissues in our body. So if you, we go back to how you were as a kid or even as a baby, right? These kids, these younger humans have much more pliable tissues, right? They haven't gone through years or decades of use and abuse and uh, fascial densification and injuries and scar tissue. And so they're very pliable. They're, very, they're able to bounce back from things and recover really fast. And so the tissue quality is a big piece of that. Essentially what we're doing is we're trying to use deep pressure and friction to not just increase the, the local temperature of the tissue, but it creates a whole cascade of effects on a cellular level that helps to deaden and relax the muscle tone, helps to loosen it up, and then also helps not just how well it can extend, and that's what's called the extensibility, but also how well it's gonna be able to contract. So it's not just one of these things where tissue work can be thrown out and said, well, it's just gonna reduce your power output. It actually will help you contract a dysfunctional muscle better if you're able to work through some of those adhesions and improve the hydration level of that tissue. So all that being said, let's go ahead and dive into the video. Um, I will also just say, we're gonna go through a ton, a ton today. Definitely don't feel like you have to spend an hour, two hours working through your entire body head to toe and doing all of these things. I'm just giving you guys some ideas. What we would like, typically like to see is when we do a head to toe movement screen of an, of an athlete, we might find two, three, five different kind of problem points for them. And some of these other things are just kind of bare maintenance. So if you don't have a plantar fascia problem, you don't need to spend 10 minutes a day working through your plantar fascia. If the back of your shoulder is your issue, spend more time there. So dedicate your time on your actual problem spots Time is a really finite resource as an athlete, and so we can kind of uh, gloss over some of the less important spots for you and focus on some of the more imp important and dysfunctional spots uh, in your specific case. So starting with the feet, uh, specifically we're gonna be targeting the, the bottom side of the foot or the plantar fascia. Uh, this can get very, very dense, painful, gritty, uh, especially with athletes who kind of have plantar fasciitis or inflammation of, of the bottom of the foot. So obviously you can use kind of tried and true uh, lacrosse ball, uh, tennis ball, that's specifically uh, very painful. Um, we actually like this foot roller from Trigger Point. Uh, this can work very well. Uh, you can also use a PVC pipe or a barbell. So again, it doesn't have to be go out and spend a bunch of money and buy all these fancy tools. Uh, but we do like this uh, very well. So you can again work through the bottom of the foot, work through eversion, inversion a little bit, and spend two to five minutes uh, working through that tissue until you kind of feel the tenderness and the sensitivity die down from wherever it starts to, you know, maybe a two or three out of 10. For the lower leg, so the calves and then the anterior tibialis are kind of the, the front part of your shin, um, you know, better to use kind of a foam roller or if you want to be a little bit more aggressive uh, as you adapt to that. Um, I found that the Battlestar 
Uh, Mobility Wad Battlestar works really well. They have a number of different attachments, so this would be the biggest attachment, and then you can, again, progress to uh, a smaller diameter attachments as well. Uh, I found that works really well. If you don't want to go and invest in this, then a barbell on the ground also really works very well, and you can just drape the other leg on top of the, the calf that you're working and just work back and, back and forth through there. Uh, you can also pin the tissue and then work through uh, plantar flexion and dorsiflexion to give yourself a little bit of a self-active uh, release type technique. And then if you flip over on your stomach, you can also roll out the anterior tibialis or that lateral part of your shin as well. Um, that's gonna be a little bit more sensitive, so a barbell might be too much for that. Um, a regular foam roller or kind of this larger attachment on the Battlestar will be good for that uh, anterior tibialis muscle. Moving on up to the quad, we still really like the, the Battlestar for this. Um, you're probably gonna be able to graduate from the larger attachment fairly quickly if you do this for a few weeks uh, straight. When you're rolling out the quad, um, and again, for most of these points, don't just gloss over the tissue and spend 30 seconds and kind of move on. If you have a particularly dense point, for example, there's often a point kind of upper uh, rec fem, upper rectus femoris muscle, stay on that specific part of the muscle belly. So if 75% of that quad is, is not that tender, but 25% is, stay on that spot and spend most of that time uh, on that specific spot, just kind of oscillating through that specific point. You can also stay on that point and go through knee flexion, knee extension, Again, giving yourself a little bit more of an active release technique. Again, that's a little bit more expensive. Uh, the rumble roller, a pretty affordable alternative to that. And again, we have these little knobs here so you can really focus and find those pinpoint uh, density spots. Again, we're not trying to target the entire quad. We're trying to target the worst parts of the quad and spend our time and focus it there. So rumble roller uh, and battle star for the quad are our two favorites there. So for the adductor and hamstring complex, uh, there's a bunch of ways to target this, again, depending on how new you are to targeting those muscles. The adductor is a super underappreciated muscle in pitchers. As far as taking care of the tissue quality, it can really affect your ability to get into your back leg, your stride length, uh, and a potential contributor to hip pain as well. So one of the best ways to start with this is to actually just use a barbell set up about waist height in the squat rack. And so you can drape your leg over that and you can really work through the entire length of your adductor. Again, it's probably gonna be that upper third of your adductor, adductor magnus, um, right as you get all the way up into your groin that really has the worst spots for most guys. And again, as you angle your body, you can bias it more towards hamstring. Um, you can, again, lay on top of the, the barbell with your particular leg over it and you can really target the hamstring a lot better than just using a foam roller on a ground like I see a lot of people use. Um, from there, there's a number of ways to progress it. Another way that I like is to have a kettlebell for the adductor. So again, you're just laying on the ground, bend that knee and drape that side leg over the handle of the kettlebell. And so again, it just gives you a little bit more pinpoint way to get in there. The absolute most effective way that I found to get into the high add adductor is actually uh, with this tool called the hip stick. I'll link in the video description where I got this hip stick, but it's cheap. Um, and this is a way to really get pinpoint up into that kind of high adductor attachment. And if you're not feeling it on this, then your tissue quality is likely in a very good spot. Um, but this is very effective for hip pain, very effective for a tight groin. And this can link very well to any sort of other hip mobility flow or isometrics or static stretching or anything like that that you're doing. Start off with a few minutes of adductor tissue work and then progress into that. As far as kind of getting into the high hamstring adductor uh, complex, uh, another way besides just draping your leg over a barbell is using something a little bit bigger. A lacrosse ball doesn't work that well, uh, but something like a softball, so softball sized. Um, this is actually called the Orb. Um, and so they have a bunch of different size balls, but I like the softball size one for that high adductor. And so you'll sit on a box and you can really position that ball like right up in that adductor magnus hamstring kind of attachment and really kind of work through hip rotation, knee flexion, knee extension, and really be able to target those tissues in a little bit more of a pinpoint and focused way. So again, this is the orb and they have a whole range of sizes. Uh, now we get to the psoas, which is a really kind of underappreciated muscle. Um, this is one that is traditionally very, very difficult to get on your own without a therapist. Um, it's also hard to evaluate like if this is truly an issue on you or not. Um, but what I do uh, recommend after trying it and using it is the SoRite. Um, there are a number of kind of competitors of the SoRite now that actually do allow you to adjust the width um, but depending on your body size. Um, but this is pretty good for you know most athletes that we've seen. But essentially it's going to be right around belly button height or a little bit lower. You're just going to lay on your stomach and kind of relax into it. And again, the psoas is a very deep muscle, um, you know, intertwined with, with the lumbar spine. And so this can really wreak havoc on your hip mechanics, your lumbar mechanics, and be a, real, a cause of hip and low back pain as well. 
So addressing the tissue quality alone isn't always the solution. A lot of times with the psoas, it's actually a weakness problem as well. So a lot of times we'll, we'll kind of pair those two things. It's addressing the tissue quality, but also addressing the strengthening component of the psoas. But again, this is the right. There's some more affordable options, uh, very similar design on Amazon as well, I believe. So moving on to the lateral hip now, we're talking kind of TFL attachment, um, reflective head of the rec fem so right up in this kind of high corner where a lot of guys will get kind of bound up and gritty and even just poking around you can tell a lot of guys will have a very dense uh, point right in that kind of tfl and uh, and rec fem attachment point um, also wrapping around it's a kind of glute mead attachment as well so this spot I've actually found the rumble roller works pretty well just because it does have these knobs on it. So that's a good starting place. I do like to progress it to the Accumobility Ball. I found that this works well because uh, it doesn't roll around as much so you can kind of fix it to the ground and as you're rolling through it, it can just be a little bit more uh, a little more user friendly uh, for some of these particular spots. Um, as you're doing that, again, you can work through hip rotation just to try to target the TFL and a little bit of more of an active release. And you can also work through hip flexion, hip extension while you're on the ground with that. And then a lacrosse ball obviously can work as well Again, this is another one of those, uh, those orb uh, balls. This is the Orb Extreme Mini. So again, they have a whole range of sizes, a little bit uh, softer than a lacrosse ball, uh, but also a little bit firmer than a tennis ball. So kind of somewhere right in the middle there. So moving up into the mid back, the thoracic spine, and, and even like the rhomboids and the middle, middle traps, um, a couple of different tools that we like. First, if you're just trying to target thoracic spine extension and just kind of work through the actual uh, spinal component, then just a regular foam roller can work really well going through some basic flexion extension patterns over top of that roller and opening up the T-spine. If you're trying to target more of the soft tissue, uh, the spinal erectors, uh, or actually the kind of rhomboids, uh, really like the, the peanut. So you can buy trigger point peanuts, you can buy uh, peanuts where the balls are literally connected to each other, or you can just uh, duct tape to tennis balls uh, into a sock and you pretty much have the same thing. You have a peanut and so you'd roll right across that peanut and kind of work through the thoracic uh, erectors on either side of the spine. Rumble roller works really well just with these knobs. And then most of you guys have probably seen the Theracane. Uh, that can also work really well for very dense and precise like round boy trigger points or middle trap trigger points. Uh, one thing to be aware of with any sort of scapular type trigger points is sometimes what we've seen is those can be more like protective tension and so you attack those, you beat them up, you're really sore for a couple of days, it comes right back. And so that can be uh, something where it's not always the direct cause and just gotta be careful with knowing, you know, what exactly you're trying to target. Um, sometimes there can be a slight kind of displacement of one of those ribs posteriorly. And so you have this really dense gritty trigger point right over top of that, but it's really actually the rib needing to be adjusted by a chiro or a therapist. And it's not actually something you can just grind your way into submission. So um, kind of be careful from that standpoint, but again, peanut, rumble roller, uh, regular foam roller, and then the Theracane is also good in, in certain cir circumstances. All right, so now we're getting a little bit higher up. We're getting into the lat. Uh, we know the lat is one of the most important uh, muscles to uh, work through that tissue quality for throwers. We need to be able to get full overhead shoulder flexion. We need to be able to get into that clean layback position and not have our scap being constantly and chronically dragged into depression and downward rotation. So we need that lat to be able to extend and be able to allow us to get into some of these positions uh, with clean shoulder mechanics. The problem is it's a very tough muscle to get on your own. Um, one of the ways that we have found that's, that's decent is with the Battle Star, um, you're probably going to be able to move on to the smaller attachment with the Battle Star and again just lay on your side and work through kind of the entire length of the lat. It really is an inferior method versus just having a partner, however. So a partner's heel where you lay on your back and you have a partner or therapist kind of working through with a decent amount of pressure. You do need a good amount of pressure uh, for the lat in most cases to actually get a, a true release uh, effect and be able to get the maximum effect uh, for what we're trying to do in that small amount of time. So again, the Battlestar can work, um, but would strongly recommend uh, you know, having your trainer, therapist, uh, partner do this at least the first time so you can really see the difference in what it's supposed to feel like. So now we're getting to the subscap, uh, which is again, a very underappreciated muscle when it comes to uh, throwers and when it comes to shoulder pain and impingement as well. I have literally seen cases of athletes with shoulder pain and pinching and impingement who address their subscap for two weeks and their shoulder pain completely goes away. That's how important of a role the subscap plays. And if we can improve its ability to not just contract, but lengthen, um, we're, we're having a direct influence on the positioning of the shoulder inside the socket and on your scapular mechanics as you go through that aggressive layback into ball release. So we really want that to be as tension-free as possible, or should I say, free of adhesions and poor tissue quality as possible. 
So I found that on your own, there are ways to uh, actually try to get there with your own fingers. Uh, but I found that the jack knobber, I believe this is called the jack knobber two or three. I'll make sure to link this below. Um, this can work really well as well, just to be able to get all up in the subscap. And again, working through a little bit of external rotation to give yourself some of that active release component. Again, once you find the worst spot in your subscap, try to stay there for two, three, four minutes and just work through micro oscillating through that specific band of density rather than just spending 30 seconds on the entire muscle as a whole. And you're not really gonna get the same localized effect in that muscle. Um, however, this is another one where if you have a partner slash therapist slash athletic trainer, um, a proper subscap manual release is infinitely better than what you're gonna be able to do on your own because you are really gonna to struggle to be able to relax fully into this release on your own. So it's a tough muscle to get. It's an extremely important muscle to get. If you can have a therapist trainer uh, work through this a few times for you, um, you're gonna get a lot of benefit out of that and potentially have an easier time replicating it on your own moving forward. Now let's look at the pec minor. So uh, we know the pec minor is an extremely important muscle again for throwers. If that gets super toned up, super dense, super gritty, we know it has the ability to drag that scapula forward into anterior tilt, into horizontal adduction, and those are both directly opposing the positions we need to be able to relax and get into prior to ball acceleration. So this is one where we, we came up with uh, this exercise probably seven years ago now, uh, the barbell pec smash. And so essentially you're gonna be able to wrap a lacrosse ball around a barbell, lay supine, add a little bit of weight to the bar and really work through that specific band of tissue on your own. So I would say that's about 75% as effective as getting a true uh, active release from a therapist, athletic trainer, partner, uh, et cetera. But if you have any way to do this, a partner's elbow, uh, a therapist's hands are significantly more effective at least initially, to be able to get into those kind of hard to reach corners through the pec minor and all the way up kind of into the attachment point. So again, extremely important undervalued muscle uh, from a tissue quality standpoint for throwers. You're not gonna get the same effect by just leaning up into a doorway with a lacrosse ball, rolling over it for three seconds and thinking that you're good. Even if you feel like it's a little bit tender, uh, just trust me, this is one you have to get fairly deep. There needs to be a good amount of pressure to really get the lower kind of underlying layers of the pec minor and to truly get the release that you're actually going for. Again, it's deep to the pec major. It's harder to get to. So give the barbell pec smash a try, but if you can, uh, we have various partner ver versions of this that we show our athletes how to do with their trainer as well. So moving on to the subclavius, if you don't know what the subclavius is, that's okay. Uh, all you need to know is that it's a muscle just below your clavicle, so just below our collarbone. Uh, subclavius is a muscle right under here. So if you kind of poke through from one end all the way to your AC joint, you're really just looking for density, trigger points, a little bit of tenderness. This is specifically relevant for guys who have a little bit more muscle mass. Maybe it's the guy on your team with a 315 pound bench press who has a just larger pecs. A lot of times they're the guys who, they just have more tissue. They have uh, more issues with being able to get all this tissue to open up and allow them to get into better positions. So if you have any density through this area, uh, actually we found that just a thumb, your own fingers can work really well. Um, if you're just seated, it can also work well to kind of let that arm and scap hang forward and that's going to expose kind of the underbelly underneath the clavicle and you're going to have an easier time actually getting to those points again for me i don't have any issues there i don't feel any tenderness but definitely seen athletes where it's an eight out of ten tenderness and so either a trainer partner um, you know thumb and finger or just your own thumb and finger and just staying on that specific spot cross frictioning it for two three four minutes however long it takes to go from a six seven eight out of ten to a two three four out of ten and then moving on for both the bicep and tricep, uh, we found this is actually pretty easy to hit on yourself uh, with the barbell. So with a barbell or your bicep, this is easiest to do supine and just letting the barbell kind of lay down on your arm and just working through flexion extension and slowly just working your way up and down and focusing on the most tender spots. For the tricep, it's easier to actually have this set up about chest high in a squat rack and just drape your arm over the bar find the spots that are particularly painful and you can actually use your other arm to sink down, add a little bit more pressure and then work through flexion extension, internal rotation, external rotation. So a lot of times with throwers, it's kind of that upper third uh, long head of the tricep that gets really dense gritty and can start to, again, as we tie into to the shoulder um, and cross the shoulder, 
that can start to affect scapular mechanics as well and really present with issues going into layback and that kind of tightness feeling as you go into layback and contribute to some of these impingement symptoms as well. So barbell for both bicep and tricep. When it comes to the posterior shoulder, I think most pitchers know that this is an important spot, spot to take care of. Uh, we know that our posterior uh, cuff, so our three rotator cuff muscles on the back side of our shoulder are extremely important. All right, every pitcher does arm care nowadays. Every pitcher does rotator cuff exercises, um, but how many of them actually take care of the tissue quality as well as they could? So uh, what our athletes typically use is if you have a tennis ball or a lacrosse ball, that's a good place to start. Uh, again, I like the Acu Mobility Ball because it doesn't move around as much. Um, so it can just make it a little bit easier to get to some of those points. Um, the Orb is great. They just have, again, different sizes. A golf ball can work. Uh, I've just seen that a golf ball might be a little bit too small at times to actually get as much weight into it as you really need. So this tool, the Jack Knobber, as we already talked about, um, again, has different sized uh, points along it. I can almost guarantee you're not gonna need to use these smaller points. Uh, even the biggest point is more than painful enough. Um, again, this is one where you can kind of start on your side on the ground and just start kind of working through kind of the very back side of your shoulder where if you just kind of grab your entire delt where your fingertips end up. So really through the kind of Terry's minor area. But if we work down just a little bit from there, just a hair further down, you're gonna be in the Terry's major. And that's another spot that's kind of underappreciated as well in throwers. So give yourself a little bit of a radius to search through with this. Any spot where it suddenly feels like you're just getting stabbed with a knife, likely a good spot to spend some time. You probably don't wanna start with this. So start with a lighter uh, implement like a tennis ball and then be able to progress up to this until, again, two, three, four minutes until that sensitivity starts to die down, focusing on that really dense, tender point of tissue, not just kind of glossing over the entire tissue as one. So when it comes to the forearm, right, most pitchers do forearm exercises, forearm strengthening type, type work, um, but not a lot of them spend a ton of time on tissue work. Or they might do some grass in here and there, and that's, that's kind of a start, um, maybe some voodoo flossing here and there. Um, but something that we've, we've had now for I think six or seven years, honestly, is it's called the arm aid. And so what you basically can do is you can find these dense points uh, through your pronator uh, flexor attachment, through kind of the meat of your pronator, um, you know, through kind of the, the supinator and the extensor tendons, right? These are gonna be kind of the common points in throwers where you're gonna have those, those really dense, gritty points. And so again, there's different attachments that you can put in here, kind of clamp the arm through there and work through range of motion wise uh, to give yourself kind of the active release technique. So this is one of the best things that we have found. Again, you can also just use your fingers. You can find those dense points and you can just work through uh, with your fingers uh, or with the help of your trainer or therapist. Again, assuming that you've identified this is an issue that you need to focus on. I would not go and obliterate your flexor right before pitching in a game 20 minutes later. Uh, this is something to spread out over the course of a week and start attacking kind of gradually and making sure that you're not overly uh, destroying this tissue in season right before pull downs, right before kind of some sort of velocity testing phase. Uh, when we get to the neck, uh, again, the neck is a little bit more complex. So definitely something that if you have a trainer or therapist, uh, this, this is best done uh, with their help. Uh, but as far as working through the scalenes, anterior, middle, posterior scalenes, um, using your own thumb or using your own fingers can be a really easy way to do that. And so that's something that we'll coach our athletes through on how to kind of work through those muscles and get a little bit of kind of uh, tissue work that way so it doesn't have to require some you know fancy piece of equipment but something for uh, for the neck that we found uh, is this neck massager i know there's a bunch of different ones you can get on amazon if you just search uh, neck massager and so this is going to be a little bit more kind of posterior side of your neck but this can really help if you're having any sort of headaches any sort of tension if you're a guy with a ton of forward head posture and you know you always wear a backwards hat in the car and you're always just chin forward and a ton of tone uh, through that posterior part of your neck um, this can really help target that spot and just working through uh, with this neck massager. So when it comes to the neck, again, fingers or this neck massager are our two favorite options. Lastly, for the upper trap, uh, very simple, set up a barbell around shoulder height in the squat rack, get up underneath it. You can get a really good active release of the upper trap. So come up underneath the bar, grab it with the opposite hand, give yourself some pressure, and then just work through flexion extension with your neck, target that kind of middle uh, to upper portion of the upper trap. So something else I haven't touched on here because you're not gonna be able to do it yourself, but it really can be a huge difference maker is dry needling. So if you do have access to a therapist that does dry needling, um, this can be a much more precise and quick way to address uh, various kind of tissue quality issues throughout your body. So 
specifically when we're talking about something like the posterior shoulder or the lat or the pec minor. Um, this can just kind of be a, a very precise shortcut that doesn't require weeks of kind of smashing and grinding on tissue to get a similar effect. So if possible, uh, if you really do have a ton of issues through your scap and you're trying to expedite the process, it's something where you can do some tissue work, but you can also pair that on top of a couple times a week of some good dry kneeling. That can really be a huge, huge difference maker from what we've seen. And then some other modalities that your therapist might have that can be helpful. Uh, one is shock wave, uh, two is a uh, fat tool. Uh, the fat tool, so fascial abrasion technique and voodoo floss, um, it's not really kind of as deep of a technique, it's more targeting uh, the underlying sliding mechanism and, and the surface level uh, kind of fascial quality. Um, so that can certainly be very helpful. And then uh, again, grass and then cupping as well fit into kind of that same boat, although I'm not as big of a fan of grass and cupping, just haven't seen nearly the same effects uh, from some of these other techniques. Um, and then just to summarize, like some of these body parts, um, while we can target them with some of these uh, kind of cool tools and, and different implements, um, the ones that I, I would say are most important to have a, a therapist, if you do have that as an option or a trainer work on you manually, lat, subscap, pec minor, tricep, and then anything to do with your neck. Those are the spots that are really difficult to have the exact same effect uh, just working through yourself unable to kind of relax into those positions or just being able to really get into those uh, kind of nitty gritty corners uh, of those different body parts. So again, hopefully you guys have taken something away from this video, giving you guys a bunch of implements. I'll link it all down below. Um, but again, don't discount if you have the resources, uh, if you have the way to kind of do some of the partner mobilizations uh, that we share with our athletes, um, those can certainly be an even greater difference maker in terms of working through the tissue quality in your body. Thanks again guys for watching and I'll see you in the next video.